We did it. I still can't believe we got this project done so fast and so well. When I'm in New York. I'm in Chicago. And I'm in L.A. But we're making it happen in Miro. Together. Our best work just happens faster on Miro's collaborative online whiteboard. No more scheduling meeting after meeting for work that could happen from anywhere. Whether it's getting design feedback here, mapping timelines here, or brainstorming next steps here. It all just happens on the Miro board. Exactly. And it's nice not having to wait an entire day to get sign off from this guy. Hey! Well, it is true. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com. The first three boards are free forever. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 150. Operation Typhoon. Last time, the Germans of Operation Typhoon, feeling confident with how things were going so far, expanded their attacking approach towards the Soviet capital. To the north of the main road to Moscow, the city of Kalinin, some 160 kilometers or 100 miles, had been captured. The Russian defenders, locally under the command of General Konev, Zhukov's deputy, had tried to retake the urban area, but the Germans proved just as competent at defense as they were at attack. However, the new owners of Klenin now found themselves unable to move forward, to the north or east. But that worked out as General Strauss's Ninth Army, along with the 3rd Panzer Group under General Reinhardt, then turned south, as planned, to menace Moscow from the north. The same thing was happening south of Moscow, as Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group, along with the 2nd Army of General Week, already far to the south, now turned and headed in a northeasterly direction, which left the approach of the 4th Panzer Group, along with Kluge's 4th Army, on the main roads to Moscow, coming directly eastward. On came the Germans, infantry, and Panzer, along the main roads. Before them, waiting, were parts of four rifle divisions. Per Soviet military doctrine, the rifle division was the backbone of the Red Army. Fine enough, but rifles were no longer adequate, certainly not against the most professional and experienced fighting force on the planet. And, to be sure, the Soviets had tanks, artillery, and planes, but they were all suborned to the rifle unit. The problem was, there weren't currently enough rifles, tanks, planes, or large guns in between the oncoming Germans and Moscow. And strangely enough, each Soviet ground unit, be it a division or army, did not have its own attached air wing. That would quickly change, but for now, the ground forces would attack or defend the air force stationed nearby would hopefully be around at the right time to add to the fight. But there was no close coordination. That would change too. But for now, there was only one formation out of the entire Red Army that had its own air force. As covered previously, behind the weak Mozhiask line was the Moscow Reserve Front. But neither the Mozhiask or the Reserve had enough men worth anything. So the Stavka ordered that they join and cover together the four main roads to the capital. This was on October 13th, just three days after the German 4th Army started its approach again towards the Mozhiesk line. But this time, the Russians, normally slow in their movements, certainly compared to the Germans, now moved with alacrity. This new front, the Western Front, placed the 16th Army at Volokomask, just to the northwest of the capital, the 5th Army at Mozhiask, dead center, the 43rd Army at Maloaras Lavets, to the southwest, and the 49th Army at Kaluga, further 
to the southwest of Moscow. Now, the four main roads were covered, but this new defensive line overall was anything but continuous. But as the weather worsened, the Russians were betting that just by covering the roads, they would best hinder the aggressors. And their bet seemed to pay off. The Germans, using the best maps they could get, and that was a pathetic story in itself, came east on all four roads. The two sides met and clashed on October 11th, which was two days before the Stavka ordered all these armies forward. Yet the Soviet generals had already placed what men they had along these four points. But the Germans didn't know this. So the attackers believed they were dealing with masses of infantry and approached carefully. This was not true, of course, but as each hour and day went by, more Soviet soldiers appeared along the four main roads. What evolved, in effect, were the Russians feeding men into the lines just as fast as they arrived, as most of the fighting went on from the 11th to the 16th. The Germans were doing the same thing, but for a different reason. Men and armor were sent to engage the line, which didn't break, so more men and armor were sent in. In essence, the fighting along all four points became a meat grinder, chewing up the fresh arrivals. This was a bloody business, But the Germans were not advancing. Besides, Soviet Russia had already lost millions of men, what were a few hundred thousand more. But not helping either side, though it can be argued the defenders benefited more, the weather took turns, freezing the ground, then allowing it to thaw, which then turned it to muck, then freezing it again. So, if the Germans were going to advance, they needed those roads cleared. Because the Soviet line was far from complete, the fighting broke into four separate engagements. Yet the Germans found themselves unable to flank any particular battle due to the quagmire. Their only recourse was to put their heads down and power through, which is pretty much what happened. The Germans slogged ahead. The Russian lines gave ground as they were undermanned and under-equipped. And believing that victory was a foregone conclusion, as the Germans kept up the pressure for the next three weeks, they eventually captured Volokolomsk, north of the main road, the city of Mozhiesk, of the Mozhiesk Line, the city of Malarioslavets, to the south of Mozhiak, and Kaluga, further south of the main road. But now that they had the momentum, the Germans kept going. By the end of October, they made their way to the edges of Kubinka, which is halfway between Mozhiesk and Moscow, along the main road. And they made their way to Naroforminsk, just south of Kubinka, and towards Serpukov and Tula, due south of the capital, by some 96 kilometers, or 60 miles, and 160 kilometers, or 100 miles, respectively. The 4th Army's furthest units were now only some 120 kilometers, or 80 miles, from the capital. The last one, Tula, was practically undefended as the Germans approached. Still, a volunteer battalion was quickly formed, from factory workers, pensioners, and teenagers. Their assignment was to guard a railway station just on the edge of town. These men put up the best resistance they could, and at least stopped the invaders from just rushing into the city. Thus was Tula given a reprieve, for now. At Maloyaroslavets to the south, Soviet pilots had reported seeing approaching panzers. Yet they were not believed, because that would mean the Germans were only 80 miles or 128 kilometers from the capital. Impossible. More reports came in of advancing German armor, but these, too, were ignored. Even Stalin refused to believe the Germans had come this far and threatened to hand over the man in charge of the pilots to the NKVD. Yet, they were right, and the city was surrounded and captured. At Volokolomsk, 
on one of the northern roads to Moscow. The Germans hit the frayed Soviet line there with overwhelming numbers. Parts of the defensive line had no one manning them, just stakes driven into the ground to denote where the defenders should go, had there been enough personnel to spread around. The Germans came at Volokolamsk on October 15th. The 316th Division stood its ground there for as long as it could. But between its casualties and the Germans slipping in between the gaps to surround other parts of the line, the 316th broke, despite a direct order from Stalin himself. Yes, they would be shot at some point in the future, but if they stayed and fought, they would die tonight. It was not a hard decision to make. At the very center of the Mozhiask line on October 11th, the 5th Army, such as it was, manned by three tank brigades, mere cadets from a Moscow military college, and the 32nd Division, all under the command of General Leilushenko, all braced themselves. Colonel Polo Shukina of the 32nd found himself standing on the very ground Kutuzov had fought Napoleon in 1812. There was a museum there that was being packed up to be shipped away. Colonel Polutsukhina found the visitor's book of the museum, but before it was packed away, he wrote into it, I have come to defend the battleground. The Germans came on October 13th, the same day Napoleon had. The next day, the Germans charged the defensive line. General Leilushenko himself was hurt in hand-to-hand fighting, which gives an indication of the ferocity of the battle. And the defenders held out for five days. The battle's intensity equally savage each day. But their line was breaking. Other parts were being surrounded. The Mozhiask line fell back, in relatively good order, down back the road towards Moscow. But there was a change. Perhaps due to the proximity of Moscow, the men, women, and children fighting were retreating a little at a time, rather than the helter-skelter panic of days gone by. After all, they were all running out of room to run. Though the Russians were falling back with each loss, they held their cohesion, which was a vast improvement over the first days of Barbarossa while the command structure equally remained comparatively calm, and fed in reinforcements from Lt. Gen. Efremov's brand new 33rd Army. These men went straight into the fighting at Nairo Farmisk, south of the main road, and though these inexperienced men could not hold back the Germans, they did delay them enough. For then came the Rasputista rains, which were coming down so hard, they, along with the defenders, stalled the entire advance of Army Group Center by the end of the month. Specifically, it would be truer to say that the feet-thick mud stopped the panzers and motorized infantry. The Germans could still attack. They would just have to, for now, leave their heavy equipment behind. And they had the men, but in another sense... They didn't. First, the Germans, because of their confidence, overconfidence really, and military prudence, had sent a panzer group and army of infantry each to the north and south of Moscow, thus weakening the main axis of attack. Second, the large groups of trapped Russian soldiers to the west of Moscow, near Vyazma and Bryansk, needed destroying. The survivors needed guarding. Field Marshal Bach would lose two weeks after the Western and Reserve Fronts had been smashed, dealing with those men. So, between the delay and the weakening of the direct attack line before Moscow, when the Stavka's defense was at its weakest, helped stall the German advance towards the capital. Had Bach kept most or all of his men together, they could have continued on, despite the weather, and achieved even more stunning successes on their way to Stalin's headquarters. But that's not what happened. Which was fortunate for the defenders. Compared to the opening phase of Germany's attack on Soviet Russia, 
The Stavgat now had five times fewer men, and they were now defending their main cities, just outside of those cities. Truly, the Germans had handed the Soviets a tremendous string of defeats, costing them millions of soldiers, thousands of planes, tanks, and guns. But then came the miracle. As November began, the Stavka started receiving reports of the arrival of the first units of Russia's Red Army Strategic Reserves, men and equipment from far inside the massive country, who were never supposed to be needed in the West, were now arriving. Their assignment? To save Stalin's entire universe from Hitler's hordes. Postscript. As for those almost 700,000 new Soviet prisoners of war, which had held up the many German divisions who had the assignment to kill or capture them, it can be argued that it would have been better had they died in the fighting. Some were true soldiers, others soldiers for only weeks or months before this moment, and some, many of them, had been with the volunteer divisions. These professors, teachers, factory workers, musicians, and a few ballet dancers were about to enter a world few could imagine. At first, they were hustled into makeshift prison camps, but ones meant to hold far fewer prisoners. One such was Dulag 130, just outside Roslov. There were far too few barracks. All were unheated, and there was precious little food for so many mouths. Even less were the supplies of medicine for the sick. Groups of prisoners were sent out under guard to search for food. If someone couldn't keep up or fell from exhaustion, they were shot while still on the ground. Clearly, they were not going to contribute, and it meant less men for the guards to look after. Those that returned from the search were even more tired now and started giving in to their weakened state. They grew sick and watched their wounds from previous injuries turn gangrious and their arms and legs turned black. The smell of death, their impending death, hung in the air. Before December came, the death rate rose 4% a day, every day. The intense interrogation tactics used by the guards contributed to this increase. If it was suspected that someone had information or a connection to any of the nearby partisans, currently disrupting communications, supplies, and letters from the homeland. As the German offensive came to a halt, still west, north, and south of Moscow, it was deemed safest for the Germans to transfer some of their prisoners to a camp closer to Smolensk. So, they were marched west, still having little food or medicine. Many thousands would not complete the journey. To be sure, the prisoners made many attempts to break out, which would result in mass shootings. These bodies had to be buried for the sake of hygiene. The prisoners, of course, did the work, which left them even weaker. It was a vicious cycle. Bread aisle, are you ready to rock? Dave's Killer Bread is the country's number one organic bread for a reason. Always delivering killer taste, killer texture, and killer nutrition. This isn't bread. This is bread amplified. 